thank you for joining us for the second lecture in the 2009 Insight Series. I'm Colleen Pittner, AIGA's Programming Director and Co-Director of Education. Without even the benefit of green beer, you are in for another evening of inspiration, I promise. But before we get started, I have a few announcements about some exciting upcoming events. Don't forget that the 2009 AIGA Design Show Reception will be held at the Weisman Art Museum this Thursday, March um, 18th? 19th. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong date here. Um, from 6 to 9 p.m. Yes, that's the day after tomorrow. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to celebrate the extraordinary design that comes out of our talented design community with your friends and colleagues, and I hope to see you there. Then on Thursday, March 26th, the fourth event in the So series for the emerging designers will be held at the Minnesota Center for the Book Arts at 6 p.m. And next month, AIGA's 16th Annual Portfolio One-on-One -on -one event will be held on April 24th and 25th at Solera in downtown Minneapolis. As you know, this is a not-to-be-missed opportunity to participate in the largest portfolio reviewing event in the country. For all of you students in the audience, mark your calendars for 5 p.m. next Tuesday, March 24th. The MCAD Design Club will be hosting an ice cream social before the, Amer uh, the Experimental Jet Set Lecture. This is a terrific opportunity to meet your fellow design students and to compare notes. Check the AIGA Student Community Facebook page for further details. And finally, to make you professionally, ooh, <laughs> that's one heavy leprechaun. <laughs> To make you professionally prepared for Portfolio One-on-One, -on -one, attend Portfolio Day at Penco Artists Supply Warehouse this Saturday the 21st from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This informal come and go event will feature discounts and demonstrations on the latest presentation products that can help your work stand out. Again, go to the AIGA Student Community Facebook page for further information information. So now for the gold at the end of the rainbow. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Andrew Blauvelt, Design Director at The Walker. I am grateful to Andrew and his amazing design team for partnering with AIGA Minnesota to make this lecture series possible. It has been the luck of the Irish for me to work with all of them. So please join me in giving a big round of applause to Andrew. And I'm only one quarter Irish, so. <laughs> Which no one believes, okay. Um, uh, well, certainly welcome to Insights 2008. It's co-presented, of course, with AIJ Minnesota and the Walker Arts Center in our, what, 20-something year? I stopped counting. 24th. 24th, OK. <laughs> um, I have a couple of design-related announcements as well before I introduce tonight's uh, speaker. Um, the AIGA and Walker will um, present two uh, regional film premieres, design film premieres, one on Thursday, April 30th, um, which is Objectified, a new documentary film about product design with uh, director Gary Hutzwit, who will be in attendance to answer questions, uh, I guess with me, according to his website, um, which I didn't know, but I'll prepare. Um, <laughs> after the 7 p.m. screening, and then we also have a 9 p.m. screening of the film. And so um, it's, it just uh, premiered last week at South by Southwest, and it's been getting really uh, good reviews. So I hope you're able to do that. And then on Thursday, May 28th, 
just about a month later, we'll have um, Milton Glaser to Inform and Delight, which is a new documentary film about the man who brought us I Heart New York, among other things, um, uh, with director Wendy Key, who will also be here to answer questions after the 7 p.m. screening. So again, it's a 7 p.m. and a 9 p.m. screening. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for those two events. Um, both films, um, as I mentioned, are co-presented with AIJ Minnesota and are part of John Here Contemporary Design and Conversation, which is a series as part of Target Free Thursday Nights. Um, and in terms of insights, we are two lectures left, of course. I think, I didn't check, but I think we still have some tickets. Oh, waiting list for next week. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, wait list, <laughs> wait list is available for Experimental Jet Set and then Ellen Lupton at the end of the month to finish out the series. So please pick up those tickets. And just a reminder that all lectures um, are streamed live and archived on the Walker channel, which you can reach through the Walker's website, walkerart.org. And all archived material from the channel is now also available at iTunes U. So that's the end of my announcements. Um, so to tonight's speaker. Um, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, David Reinfurt. Um, based in New York, David is an independent graphic designer um, who from the first day of uh, first business day of the new millennium formed ORG and who with Stuart Bailey in 2006 formed Dexter Sinister. David studied at the University of North Carolina and received his MFA in graphic design from Yale University in 1999. He has taught and has been a visiting critic at numerous universities, including the ITP program, the, uh, um, yeah, the ITP program at NYU in New York, uh, Yale University, Columbia University, the Royal College of Art in London, the Garrett Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam, and the Rhode Island School of Design. In 2006 and 2007, David was a research affiliate at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, where he examined the work of Muriel Cooper, the late legendary book and information designer, with whom I believe he shares a similar quest to explore the specific technical and technological challenges of the day as open-ended investigations. David's work spans many fronts from the interaction design for the New York City subway vending machines and his work for the Spatial Information Design Lab's Million Dollar Blocks project to his writings for publications such as Dot 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 and Metropolis M. Taking a cue from the transformations in the world of product manufacturing, Reinford and Bailey have applied the post-Fordist ideas of just-in-time economies with local production strategies, and I think in a twist on flexible specialization, have integrated the typically discrete roles of editing, designing, producing, and distributing. Dexter Sinister, which builds itself as a just-in-time workshop and occasional bookstore, collapses production and distribution in its basement space on the Lower East Side of New York that also serves as a venue for other possible kinds of activities, from readings to film screenings to performances. The work of Dexter Sinister has been featured at the Contemporary Arts Center in Geneva and was included in the 2008 Whitney Biennial. <coughs> Excuse me. This combination of active research, speculative investigation, expanded practice, and alternative systems of engagement and distribution have placed them at the forefront of the vanguard of alternative practices of design. Um, tonight, um, David would like me to give you the title of his lecture, which is, um, and I promised I wouldn't laugh, but I'm, I'm failing miserably in that regard. <laughs> in all seriousness. Um, the title is Towards an Intuitive Understanding of the Fourth Dimension, Continued. Please help me welcome David Reinfurt. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And thank you for saying the title. Um, and thank you to the Walker for inviting me here to speak, and thank you for coming, and thank you to the AIGA for also having me here to Minneapolis. The title of the talk tonight is, as Andrew said, it's Towards an Intuitive Understanding of the Fourth Dimension Continued. And I'm gonna be talking about time. And I'm gonna be talking about time in relation to my own uh, practice, which mixes, a number of, uh, which mixes a number of things, as Andrew was describing, including writing and graphic design and editing and thinking about distribution and these kinds of things. Um, Yes, it's, the talk is going to be about an hour, so since I'm talking about time, it seems fair to tell you that up front. Maybe a bit longer than an hour. And I'll begin here. Okay, when, when I was asked to, um, to come here and make this lecture, uh, 
two of the Walker Design Department's illustrious uh, fellows, and I say that very sincerely, uh, Noah and Mylin asked sent a, a set of questions to me ahead of time uh, to try to get an idea about, uh, well, to, to get some information to use for the poster to announce the talk. And these were the set of questions um, which were sent to me, which here in my uh, circa 1988 Pine email program that I use. Um, number one, what music were you into before you became ORG and Dexter Sinister? Two, who were your heroes before blah, blah, blah. Uh, three, what were your obsessions before becoming ORG and Dexter Sinister? Four, what were your dreams? Five, what were you reading? Six, what did you do? What did you use to collect before you became? And seven, what were you before ORG and Dexter Sinister? And I thought this this email sat in my inbox way too long um, without me responding. I was feeling quite guilty about it the whole time. And I realized, uh, well, I finally sent a response. And I realized the the why I couldn't respond to these questions was because I felt like it 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 uh, set up a false distinction, which doesn't make sense for me and my my own way of thinking about my work, which is a necessarily a before and after, a kind of procession of this thing follows this thing follows this thing follows this thing, or a distinction between say the work of ORG or the work of that I publish under my own name, David Reinfurt writing, or the work of Dexter Sinister, or the work of dot dot dot, um, which I co-edit. So I sent, I finally did send a response. It took quite a while and. Um, I sent this following response, which is just I said, I'm, I'm really not sure how to respond as all the questions assume some sort of break in time, before and after. Although I do understand that things happen in an order, I typically can only make sense of them, of it as one thing, uh, continuous and connected. Now, uh, I was borrowing I was borrowing this language partially uh, from The Medium as Massage, the book published in 1964 by uh, Jerome Agel and Quentin Fiore, and based on the work of Marshall McLuhan, I'm sure you are probably familiar with this book. And this is a spread from the book, and it it continues. It's it's a it's a book which uh, which has kind of loomed large in my own uh, personal set of references for a long time. Um, but it includes this little string, which I think is uh, which I thought was worth uh, copying anyway, uh, where where. The author, who is really Jerome Agel in this point, in this case, says, its use fostered and encouraged the habit of perceiving all environment in visual and spatial terms, particularly in terms of a space and of a time that are uniform, continuous, and connected. The line, the continuum, this sentence is a prime example. OK, so that, that posits a, an organization of time which is obviously ex explicitly linear. One thing follows the next thing, follows the next thing, follows the next thing. And this kind of um, this is the way we all live life and that we all proceed from one moment to the next, but I don't actually find it's that simple, at least it doesn't help me help to organize my practice. And so I thought in preparing a talk tonight I might uh, show you things out of direct chronological order and that might be useful. So about three weeks ago I was at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And I was, had a little bit of time to kill in the afternoon and I was strolling through the new galleries there and I saw this uh, piece of art hanging. Uh, this is a painting by John Baldessari, also made in 1964, um, same year as Medium as a Massage, as it turns out. Uh, this is obviously conceptual art with a capital C, and uh, Baldessari made, uh, titles this painting, Painting for Kubler. And as I'm, I won't read from the screen the entire time, so it will get more uh, engaging, but I'm going to continue to read from the screen for a moment. So, this painting owes its existence to prior paintings. By liking this solution, you should not be blocked in your continued, continued acceptance of prior inventions. To attain this position, ideas of former painting had to be rethought in order to transcend former work. To like this painting, you'll have to understand prior work. Ultimately, this work will amalgamate with the existing body of knowledge. So this is a painting made at a certain moment in time when other paintings were also being made which had a, a similar kind of self-referential uh, quality to them and it was explicitly titled for Kubler and when I when I came across this thing it immediately triggered something in my in my mind that oh I know you know I know this painting and I've I've seen this before but but specifically I, I've been meaning to read that book by George Kubler which to whom this uh, painting is dedicated and I realized that it was originally reproduced in an article that was published in 2001 in Grey Room, an uh, art and architecture journal. Um, it was an article written by Pamela Lee. And the article was about, uh, well, it was about Robert Smithson, the artist, and about um, uh, George Kubler, and about 
time in 1960s uh, artwork. And the painting was reproduced in full in this. Um, I, as I went back, I was, uh, as I went back right after returning from Los Angeles, I went and reread this article again. Now this originally came out in 2001, I read it at the time, and I remember it being quite an important thing to read for me and something that's kind of been lodged in my brain, but I hadn't read it since then. So it's been eight years since then. I went back and reread it and I had the kind of amazing experience of that eight years in time realizing that, that this, uh, this article was very much a kind of keystone for the ways I've been thinking about approaching kind of varied practices since then. It's almost as if the, the entire story of what I was up to was already written here in this article. So it's well worth kind of going back and revisiting it. Now, in this article, Pamela Lee describes um, George Kubler, uh, his approach to the uh, ordering of art history, or the ordering of history in general, and she, she paraphrases him down here, or quotes him actually, uh, saying that the rest of time emerges only in signals relayed to us at this instant by innumerable stages and unexpected bear bearers. They're signal that we only know the past by the artifacts that it kind of lays along the way. And those artifacts are never here in the moment. They're always, they've always been, always, you're always receiving them as signals from the past. And they're kind of interrupted by the noise and by the interference that between reading it now versus reading it then or looking at this object then versus now. And it's not simply about the context in which they first existed. It's about the kind of gap between uh, the distance and noise and interference that's uh, mitigated that signal in the meantime. Um, she says the nature, well, quoting Kubler, she says, the nature of a signal is that its message is neither here nor thou, there, neither here nor now, but there and then. Okay, and that seemed quite important. Now that's from, that's from this book, uh, George Kubler, The Shape of Time, which I have here, which in preparing for this uh, talk, I thought I'd go back and read the original thing since I'd never read it at the time and kind of meant to. I just read the Gray Room articles, quite a lot shorter, easier to get through. Um, but I thought I'd go back and read this book in the meantime, and it proved to be quite productive. Uh, in this book, Kubler describes an alternative approach to the study of the history of things and to the study of art history. And he says, instead of ordering, uh, ordering time by a procession of styles, one thing to the next thing to the next thing, i.e. chronologically, and... Uh, Art, art history, or the history of things, actually, he doesn't make a distinction between art history and useful objects, actually. Just in terms of desire, he makes a different distinction. Uh, that things could be organized instead of as a series of, of one thing to the next, a progression of styles, they could be organized as a formal sequence. So as a one problem, say the problem of what a cup should look like, and many different points in time at which that problem has been attacked, and that those organize, that organizing history around certain problems and their kind of late, middle, and or early, middle, and late kind of resolutions of the uh, task at hand was another way to look at, look at history. And the, I thought this is incredibly relevant to design in general. And that is because in a kind of linear, and this is especially also relevant to recounting of doing a series of projects over time. Because uh, if, you, if it processes strictly chronologically one thing to the next to the next and by styles, then that, that automatically assumes a certain uh, belief in avant-gardism or a absolutely linear time. One thing has to improve on the next, it must go to the next, it must go to the next, and the next, and the next. And I don't know how productive that is in terms of working through design. Uh, it can lead to situations where you're simply kind of uh, articulating the shape of a, um, of a toilet flushing handle um, for no reason than to kind of get to the next greatest thing. I'm not sure how useful that is. Um, Instead, a kind of series of form, a simply a formal progression, a formal series uh, from one thing to the next to the next, and uh, implies a more circular or intermittent relationship to time. These things don't happen one after the next. Ideas come kind of intermittently when they come. And that seemed like a, like a really um, useful way for me to go back and examine some of my work of the last uh, 10 years or something like that, uh, and perhaps a good conceit to hang this, this talk around. So I'm going to be I'm going to be showing a few things. I'm going to be showing work from uh, my incarnation as ORG, which is 
uh, one way I work, uh, both with and without other people. Uh, my incarnation is Dexter Sinister, which is myself working with a partner, Stuart Bailey. Um, my work uh, with Dot Dot Dot, which I co-edit and publish with Stuart Bailey as well, but is published by Dexter Sinister, so there's some sort of delayed something in there. And then, and then also my work uh, as David Reinfurt, because um, when I write articles or do other things, you know, that is my name after all. Although I find the pseudonyms quite useful, and I have numerous others which I'm not going to talk about. Um, so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you. So if I, I describe that the the past, if you if you buy this formal arrangement of history um, uh, by form problem or form class, then what I'm going to be showing you is six signals. Okay, these are these are forms which have kind of followed me around for ten years and made their way into various projects, and they allow me to talk through uh, a range of practices. Um, but they are signals. They're objects. They're kind of, I mean, they'll appear as icons more than anything else. And they'll, they'll find their way formally, not chronologically. These projects won't be happening chronologically. Um, but they'll find, they'll weave their way through a series of projects. I think that might come closer to the way that I've thought about doing work, or at least seem like a useful way to try. Um, when, I, when I was in graduate school in 1999, or finishing in 1999, I, uh, a, s a fellow classmate, close friend, who I think is here tonight, who should be here tonight, gave me a piece of advice that was a, that was a really, um, that was one of the things I take away from graduate school, which was I was into doing 35 millimeter slideshows at the time. Um, it just was something that was quite a satisfying uh, project for me to do. And, and she said, you know, don't arrange these things by meaning, arrange them formally. Just make them look good from one slide to the next and the meaning will fall out of it. And at the time, I thought it was you know, a pretty surface comment and um, not, some, not a way I was approaching it. But as soon as I tried it, I found it worked. It's like such a quick way to put together a slideshow, or such a useful way, is you just make the formal connections and the kind of rest falls out. So now, retroactively, kind of reading the George Kubler shape of time and, and understanding this other organization of a art history, it seemed like a, 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 that advice weighs, uh, I mean, practically it works anyway, but it, we'll see whether it works now, okay? Okay, so this is the first signal. This is a coat of arms. This is a coat of arms that, uh, that I designed together with Stuart Bailey as Dexter Sinister for a biennial of contemporary art, which was to be uh, taking place on the island of Cyprus um, in the capital city of Nicosia. Uh, this biennial was, it was manifest a six biennial. The curators asked Stuart and I to get involved in the project and to come up with a strategy for the graphic, or to do the graphic design for the project. And, and one part of what we did was to propose back to them, well, well let's, I need to back up one second. The, the biennial was already refigured as an art school. So instead of an exhibition, they were gonna run this biennial for six months as an art school. Um, so immediately when Stuart and I were, uh, got involved in doing this project, we realized that an art school needs a badge, needs a kind of heraldic mark, right? And something from heraldry that kind of gives it some sort of weight and uh, credibility in the educational realm. And we decided to spend a bit of time uh, uh, getting into the arcane uh, history of heraldic design, which is the design of coats of arms, and uh, likely somebody in here knows a lot more about it than I do, though I spent a good six months learning bits and pieces about it. In the end, we ended up designing this form, uh, which was the badge for Manifesto 6 Biennial School, Manifesto 6 School. Now, that form has a corresponding uh, literal form, a form in words, and the form in words of that form is party per bend sinister. Now, that form is actually called a blazon. A blazon is the words that tell you how to make this thing, how to make the coat of arms. And the reason the words existed is because it was easier to transmit the signal of a set of words over great distances to tell somebody else how to draw this form than it was to send them a picture of the form and have them copy it. So this, this was very appealing to Stuart and I, both in the kind of equivalence between the words and the image and the way they flop back and forth. And neither one is kind of the, well actually the words are the a priori graphic form, but they don't have a form. Um, and as well in c arriving at this particular uh, badge, then those, those set of words were had a nice sound to them in every bit the same way that this form had a nice resonance uh, visually for us. 
Now this was, uh, just to give you a landmark, this is about in 2005 uh, when we did this project. When we began this project, we worked on it for about six months. Now, uh, if those words were the actual essence, well, those words are actually are called a blazon in the language of heraldry. Uh, a blazon is that set of instructions that tell you how to draw the form. Uh, to emblazon those set of words means to give it form, which is where the word emblazon comes from. Uh, those words are in a highly coded language that la sounds like kind of a pig Latin, French something, hybrid, I don't know what it is. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward blazon, and it simply means party, which says divide the shield per bend sinister, from top right to bottom left, by a bend, which means diagonal, and from sin sinister means left, and so it means from top right, bottom left. Now, in, in preparing, in working on this project, we made, uh, we, uh, had practiced writing these words various ways, and we had an idea about going to Nicosia and kind of adding these words to the city, and did, did a test here at the old ORG studio right when I was moving out of the place and moving into a new location here, Stuart kind of walking out of the room, cleaning up after, the, after a party that I had when I closed down the studio and gave away all my belongings, all my studio belongings at that point, um, computers and books and all this kind of stuff, and kind of reorganizing my practice at the time. That was 2000. Six, beginning in 2006. Um, so we tested the blazon here. Uh, in advance of going to um, in advance of going to Nicosia in uh, early 2006, in January of 2006, um, where we added it to the wall here, which happened to be directly across from the Manifesto Six offices, where we also simply silk screened. Uh, uh, badge here uh, on their office, but that kind of uh, correlation of the so this and this are directly whoops are directly across the street from each other, and they are equal weights. They're both signals. They both travel. They both travel various routes uh, differently. You know, you might say that the visual form kind of travels more fluidly these days with the way that we're all so trained to kind of understand the language of logos and of icons and branding and these kinds of things. But the, wor the words and the image are presented here equally, or that's the idea anyway. Now we proceeded to work on this project for the better part of a year. Um, uh, together with the proposal for the logo, uh, we also proposed a similar production, well not a similar, a related production system to the way that they were organized in the biennial. They said, we have a certain budget to print a catalog and to send it around to uh, uh, interested bookstores, which there aren't that many. Um, and we, you know, we want you to do the graphic design for this and to design a logo for us and do some other materials. And we said, OK, great, but can we reorganize, can we reprioritize those uh, budgets? And we, can we, instead, can we take the entire budget for the whole printing, graphic design, everything, you give that all to us, and then we rearrange how it happens. And uh, amazingly, they said yes. And we said, well, what we want to do with it is to set up, we didn't really think there was actually a need to print uh, 2,000, 5,000 copies of this catalog uh, for this exhibition, which was rearranged as a school. We thought, what made, because it wasn't an exhibition, it was a school. As we thought what made a lot more sense was to make materials for the actual students who were attending classes there, who were part of this art project as school. And so we said we'd take that full money and we would establish a workshop, a storefront space in Nicosia, where we would produce the materials that were needed for the exhibition in the quantities they were needed and when they were needed there. So if somebody needed 30 copies for a, for a class, for a seminar, they would come to us and we would make 30 copies, a bit like a secretary's office or you know, a photocopy or whatever. And we uh, proceeded with this idea, even going so far as to arrange, we had a storefront space in the old town of Nicosia. We had um, arranged to borrow machinery from local printers. We had uh, arranged some students from a local art school to come help in the endeavor, and we'd arranged to be there for the better part of six months. Uh, we proceeded leading up to this to make a series of other forms, uh, including a school badge, because it was a school. They needed a badge and should look something like this here on my tweed jacket. We also used that device as an organizing uh, principle for some of the other materials. This was the application for the school, which ran as an advertisement in Art Forum and in Freeze and some other art world publications. So that's simply the text of the, uh, the text of the application set into the form of the, the badge. Um, we produced one publication leading up to this, which is this book, which is called Notes for an Art School. 
which was produced not in Nicosia because it was six months prior to the exhibition, but produced in a similar way where we were using a small local printer that we uh, had a relationship with in the Netherlands to produce a smaller quantity of these and that, that didn't depend on a kind of massive economy of scale that a typical offset printing project requires. So we could print 1,000. When they made enough money from 1,000, we could print more. Because they originally said 2,000, we kind of questioned whether there are really that many people who are so interested in how you organize an art school. We produced this first publication, and in the end, they actually all did sell out. Um, we produced a series of other materials, like, for example, a neon sign. Um, which was used at a book launch in New York. These are not in chronological order, I remind you. Um, this gentleman greeted me at the airport in Nicosia when I arrived holding a fax cover sheet. Um, not my name, I kind of found it very charming. Uh, and it really nice. And, and about that time, about the time of January 2006, when we arrived in Nicosia to spend a, a week there uh, with that publication, there's a book launch, a symposium, a couple things. Uh, not long after that, the project started to fall apart. Uh, and in fact, the project was in about two months later, three months later, uh, it was canceled completely. And it fell apart for ostensibly political reasons because Nicosia is a divided city between Turkish-occupied Cyprus and Greek-occupied Cyprus. And there are budget issues and political issues which made the entire project go up in flames. We were never, never able to institute this workshop. We were never able to kind of continue this project. But at the same time, uh, just prior to that, that's why these things don't happen in chronological order at all. Uh, we took, we had moved out, we'd had a party at my old studio at ORG and given away everything and I'd kind of thought about reorienting my practice, bringing it down near where I live. I was having a child at the time, I wanted to be quite close to home. So I found a space, we found a space that was in a basement, very cheap, on Ludlow Street in Lower East Side, New York City. And we decided to take, and that space had a kind of street access, and we decided to take that space. And we had an idea, this was before Manifesto 6 was canceled, so we thought it might be nice to, to use that space in a slightly more public manner, uh, which is simply to run it maybe as a bookstore for some of the things that we were going to be producing in Nicosia. In the meantime, the entire pro after we signed the lease, after we got everything organized, then the Manifesto 6 project fell apart. We decided to take wholesale those same ideas, there's our ideas anyway, and take the name even, and relocate it to 38 Ludlow Street in New York. In New York. And we called it Dexter Sinister, and we decided to transpose those same ideas of, we had originally called it a just-in-time workshop, and we'd added this occasional bookstore aspect to it. It's open on Saturdays from 12 to 6 as a bookstore, and otherwise it's essentially an office. We call it a workshop for a number of kind of uh, pedagogical and historical reasons connected to the Bauhaus and connected to other ways of kind of working and teaching and thinking and writing and mixing a few activities. Uh, this is the, the original sign for Manifesto, which hangs in our basement uh, on the door. These are the steps down from the street. It's a very petite space. It's about 350 square feet. The ceilings are about six and a half feet. So when, when we have tall uh, Dutch visitors, they barely fit in. Um, Stuart and I are both not very tall, so it works quite well. Feels nice when you walk in to me. I imagine not so good for the taller people. Um, <laughs> This is uh, another shot bit, bit back, pulled back. You notice in every one of these shots that the signal is in it. It becomes a little bit of spotting where it is. Here it is. Um, so the Dexter Sinister is, is a space that mixes a number of activities. And these activities are essentially a studio or workshop or office or however you want to call it, where Stuart and I share it doing graphic design, writing, editing, publishing, dot, 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 and kind of ostensibly art projects also all within this space. Uh, we use it that way from Monday to Friday. Um, on Saturdays, it becomes a bookstore. On Saturdays from 12 to 6, we magically turn on the sign and it becomes uh, open for selling books. And this, this idea began as a, a bit of a joke, of course, over a glass of, you know, over like whiskey in Nicosia late at night, that, hey, we should run a bookstore with this stuff. Um, and uh, like most things that are worth doing, the jokes are kind of worth following through because they're fun and entertaining to, to keep on pushing through. And, and we, so we said, yeah, we'll really do the bookstore. And we set it up originally with three shelves. We've since doubled the size of it to six shelves, which you see here. And we sell both dot, dot, dots that we publish. So we pay to produce it, distribute it, do everything with it, edit it, design it, et cetera. And also other publications that we work on, which are some, and other publications we just like or that friends work on or that somehow we have some connection to. It's very small curated collection of books. Um, and 
attracts a correspondingly kind of small, distinct audience who usually wants to come in there and kind of talk, which is the nicest thing about having the bookstore is on Saturdays, people come in, they want to talk, and you kind of meet interesting people, and you, it's a small community that's maybe reading these things, so it's a, it's a quite a nice platform, practically speaking, for that. There's one more part of the space that we do, and that's to run it as an event space. Well, we do events there every two months, uh, pretty much on the clock. Every two months, we'll do some sort of public event in the space. Now, when you get 30 people in here, it's packed, so it, we don't have a very ambitious reach necessarily. And these, these events may be related to some publication we've just worked on, or they may be not related at all. We've shown films. We've had a cello player. We had a recital of Brechtian Christmas carols. We had a schnapps tasting, a hair cutting um, a anything that kind of fits the, uh, what anything that sounds like a good idea to do at the time, and somebody has enough energy and whatever. I mean, they 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 are very they are quite entertaining to do, and I guess Stuart and I both kind of enjoy the um, organizing and staging of that thing because every time we rearrange the basement in a certain way to kind of we we had it set up as, as a casino for one night. That was maybe the best one, including getting a a. Uh, surveillance camera mounted in the ceiling which recorded all the proceedings and it was an artist project it was called abstract gambling by michael portnoy and he set up a table in the middle and we had a french bouncer at the door who let people in when they uh paid their 20 bucks to come in and sit down and gamble and then he determined the rules of the table so you had to be pretty brave to play because he was telling you to do things which uh well, I'm not, nothing horrible, but the rules were not consistent. You certainly weren't going to make money except accidentally, which seems about the same logic in a regular casino as far as I know. Okay, so this is the interior of Dexter Sinister. I'm going to proceed to the second signal. This is, an impossible, this is the impossible triangle. You may recognize it. It's kind of perfect internet fodder. Um, it's also known as the Penrose Triangle uh, for Roger Penrose, mathematician who uh, discovered it in the middle of the 20th century. Um, you'll see it's, it's been called impossibility in its purest form. I think that's what's attractive to it to me. Uh, as you follow it, obviously, this three-dimensional shape can't exist. It's the basis for, for example, Esch, M.C. Escher's drawings or things like this. But it has such a, uh, as you follow it, obviously, the sur surfaces do not um, continue one to the next. It's the impossible triangle. Now that triangle has, has also kind of uh, found its way through a number of projects or kind of gone on a trajectory through things. Uh, here, here it is at the top of a photogram print that Waleed Beshti, an artist in Los Angeles and a friend, um, made and which we have used since then. This is Waleed's original photogram. He made this photogram by folding paper and then exposing it to light and then afterwards inkjet printing on top of it a series of Photoshop test, test uh, items including the impossible triangle, this kind of uber cheesy, um, yeah, impossible shape. Now here's a kind of crisper version of it. This is the high-res scan that we then have continued to use, circulate through a number of projects. This image was particularly compelling to us, not just for the impossible triangle, which happened to appear there in the top through no conversation with Waleed or no kind of, I mean, I suppose it was just in the air, um, but it appeared at just the kind of right moment for us. Um, we then took this, uh, took Waleed's photogram. Uh, we had it framed for an exhibition uh, because recently, the work that I've been involved in has found itself in a different context. It's not always in a graphic design context, not always in an interactive design context, it's not always in a writing, any other kind of context. It's uh, also finding its way into art contexts, uh, in the context of group exhibitions or solo exhibitions. This was an exhibition at the St. Louis Contemporary Art Museum in January of this year. And this was part of a set of prints that Stuart and I were making together called waste prints. They're kind of leftovers from our design projects that just we thought we wanted to continue to investigate in the same way. And this, this was certainly one of them, uh, Waleed's photogram. And what we made for this series of waste prints, there are a total of nine, you're just seeing three on the wall here, uh, we wrote kind of extraordinarily long captions which don't actually explain the work, but which maybe complicate it, maybe draw it out, or maybe work in a similar way as the blazon and the coat of arms that we looked at in the beginning. They have an equal weight to the print. It's a, it's a piece of writing which is quite stylized. Stuart and I make them together. Uh, and it's around the themes that whatever we're thinking about with the print, but it generally takes approximately 10 times as long as whatever the graphic form is because those are generally just cast offs from design projects, as I was saying. So here Waleed's photogram and the impossible triangle find themselves framed in a chrome frame and hanging on the wall, very much looking like a standard 
um, art exhibition, I would say, a hang, if you will. We've also used this image um, recently in a small catalog that we just finished um, for a group exhibition in New York at Art in General. Uh, the name of the show was called Custom Car Commandos, and it happened to be about uh, the connections between the auto industry and the image production industry. Um, and we made this, we were asked to participate in the show, and we, for our participation in the show, we made a catalog for the show, if that makes sense. In other words, we weren't quite commissioned to do the catalog, but we said what we do is catalogs, and we'd love to do a catalog as an art piece in the show. And so we made this catalog, which is absolutely a catalog in every applied sense of the word, and it was a small catalog we designed and developed during, as the show was running, and it, it was based on a performance, performative lecture that Liam Gillick gave at the closing of the exhibition. Uh, this book encapsulates that text and is, um, sorry, an artist in New York, Liam Gillick, who made a, made a talk on the closing, and this book collects that text, and uh, this also arrived on the same afternoon as a week ago Saturday uh, when Liam did the talk and they were installed in the show on a shelf, et cetera. Now, uh, working up to that, when we began the exhibition, which is just in January, um, we made this invitation card, also as a kind of artist's work in the show, but as an invitation card, which, uh, which included that image, but kind of repurposed in order to make multiple of them, and these cards were chopped down and uh, used for, for different things, including as a calling card for our, for our basement, but the, the large format sheet was also used as an invitation. It's pretty simple. Thing. These things aren't. These things I'm showing are not really of equal weight in terms of uh, effort. Now, the Custom Car Commandos uh, catalog was exactly one half of the size of Dot 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 magazine, and this is the latest issue of Dot 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 magazine, which we uh, made in November of this year, and we use the same, we use Waleed's image again on the cover of this, of this project, featuring the impossible triangle. Now, this, this, uh, this issue of dot, dot, dot came about from a project that we did in London uh, in October of last year. This project was with Somerset House, and we staged three nights of, of lectures, of talks. And those talks were going to make up the full contents of the issue of the magazine. And each one of those talks took a very specific form. Uh, the first one was a slide talk, second one was a panel. Third one was a concrete poetry read aloud. The next one was a DVD shown. The next night we devolved into audio performance from the soundboard and a kind of slideshow and fog machine, and it got a little bit more Baroque. Um, this, but then the idea was to present those lectures for three nights in London and then transcribe that, that material or translate that material into the magazine, um, which you see here. I did a talk during that dur as part of the thing as part of the three nights, and my talk was around, um, well, it was called Naive Set Theory, and the Impossible Triangle figured quite prominently in this. This is a spread from the current issue of dot, dot, dot. Also, for the, in staging those, night, those three nights of lectures, the Impossible Triangle came back again, and it came back again in, the, in two props that we designed for those three nights, and these two pop, props were lecterns. We wanted to design specific lecterns that would sit at the front of this kind of uh, blacked out theater, uh, from which we would both do talks and other people who we invited would be doing talks, and these, these two lecterns are designed so that they uh, cannot be trans they are mirror images of each other, but they're three-dimensional mirror images of each other. So one cannot be translated to the next by simply rotating it. I don't know if you can tell that here, but you'll basically have to take my word for it. These are the two built um, the two built lecterns. Now those have those they are obviously an applied design project, but they embody this uh, this kind of approach to putting an idea into a thing and letting that thing circulate in the world. Uh, we've since used these exact uh, lecterns for another event in London um, and had replicas made for an event in New York City, um, which we'll get to in a minute. Now here's a picture of the lecterns just up at the front of the room on one of the evenings when I was doing an overhead lecture, overhead projector lecture, and you'll see Waleed's print here on the back with the impossible triangle, if you'll follow that around. Now, I'm gonna play a short movie here. And this is, I guess, a bit of a reenact reenactment which seems uh, not really in keeping with the strict uh, temporal hijinks that I'm trying to do here. But uh, each night of those three nights in London, Stuart and I gave an introduction. We gave the same introduction all three nights. 
Um, that introduction was delivered from the two podiums, and Stuart's voice was panned hard to the left channel, and my voice was panned hard to the right channel. And we were not reading from a script. We were performing this. We had written notes, but we were performing it off the top of our head uh, with certain points when we were supposed to line up. Um, and we introduced the three evenings in the following way. I'm going to play you this. It's about an hour, um, about a minute and 45 seconds. And I'd encourage you to kind of uh, see if you can tune in to one channel or the other. This was from the third night. I think maybe this is the most successful performance. <laughs> This here is the opening. It is in both channels, right? Yes? Okay. Uh, this was the introductory music. This is a constantly rising tone. If you have some relationship to an impossible triangle, you notice if you follow it, it's going up always. It's impossible, really. This was coming as people were filing into the room. Um, it was approximately that quiet. That's not a very... Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, Welcome to and thank Somerset you for coming. House for the last of these three nights with dot, dot, dot. Over these next three nights, over the last three um, nights, this is the last one. Please turn your cell phones we'll off. We'll be having about so ten already. lectures. And I'll start They'll by. They'll be interrupted briefly I think by ten Probably the best way to describe what's been happening if you haven't been here and what's going to happen tonight is to. Now, maybe the best idea the to get an idea about what's going to happen this evening is for me to tell you a little bit about the first two suggesting some possible subtitles for the issue that we're in the process of making. And, and to lay clear the current, three the current idea for in homage three to the, the, the Penrose one. Triangle, also known as the Impossible Triangle, which is in the image behind David. The first of those first subtitles of this would be the exhibition was effect, at the Contemporary Art Center in Geneva by last fall. Bertolt Brecht to describe for that version Brechtian of the show, theater, we which, as you might gathered know, is together kind of all the contributors of the to idea dot, of dot, dot, the number 15. Wall for two and a half weeks in Geneva at the Contemporary Art the Center and, and wrote, edited, designed, and, and printed 3,000 copies of, of the issue of there in the space of the exhibition. Of stopping the audience By the close of the show, passivity. the copies ended up back there in Geneva, role, bound, and were more, exhibited um, on a shelf in the, in the exhibition. Of the now, when the show traveled to Zurich the, a little the while later, half a year later, we exhibited simply the bookshelf full of the bound copies of Dot 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 15, as well as five framed prints the frame on the wall, which composed the, which the, the source materials translated in from multiple ways. the making of this was dot, suggested dot, dot, 15 by in Jennifer Geneva. Higgy in an email when we were in discussion of her contribution last night. Now, the only way to the continue to make the magazine is to take is advantage or to use pragmatically situations as such kind as of being invited to be in exhibitions like this. this was a so, for example, that David in Geneva, suggested about a week we, ago, when we were asked to participate in that show, remark, we needed to figure out a way to make dot, 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 dot 15, and so time. we proposed back to the organizers and curators class in that we'd like to take the sense. normal funds that would be available for an exhibition and channel that into making the magazine, in this case, quite literally producing the magazine on site with the it printers and with all the contributors learn, there in that room for two weeks. Because people could afford to now do here so. in London we wanted to do something and next that was a little that, bit when the less ambitious than what we did in Geneva and more ambitious than what we did in Zurich. So we proposed to arrange these the three nights of lectures. Learn, and therefore more so on these three nights, ten lectures have performed and will perform all of the text that comprise dot 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 number 17. Itself, whereby As usual, it should be both about and embodying an idea. In this case, it's an idea about aspects of translation. So the lectures take ten different forms of delivery, and they're from the entirely improvised, to, to entirely these pre written and scripted. Consider these and likely they'll take as many forms of translation once they find their way symbolic. on the printed page in the magazine. And the printed version, uh, a secondary source, and something literal. And the Last third week at an art school, we were asked a question. We were asked, do projects like these for our purposes to the in this context, of we can think of this as being the, the idea of translating from transparency one form to another these form kinds of things. with nothing being lost the in the translation. The only answer we could really give was a contradiction. Although, which is to say, that translation although we're certainly might interested the information. in these kind of modernist ideas, a pole poked these, into war set of ideas, just slightly or at least off equally and just disinterested in any in the kind of, of absolute or dogma. That was a quote from the novel nature. Infinite Jest by David so Foster they, Wallace. So the answer but we, we gave essentially cancelled itself out. Through Which is a, a bit designer like working in the middle of the last century called Anthony Frossard, who, or another another sentence for similar reasons, logic, titled his first, first company is there are no rules. 
So the first rule here also tonight also is that the process everything of designing appears as or will appear in dot dot seventeen must be spoken or must appear in this room over into these another three language, nights. Another set of, of symbols course, we know that's impossible. With love, and that brings us to the end of the introduction. Okay. The last project, the Impossible Triangle, finds its way into was uh, was this. Thing here, which is called a true mirror. Uh, this is a manufactured project, a manufactured product in New York. Well, it's not manufactured anymore. They went out of business in between the time that I got interested in it. But it's a it's a non-reversing mirror. Maybe you've seen something like this. It shows you your mirror's mirror image. In other words, it shows you the way that somebody else sees you. It can be quite a disconcerting thing to look into this and see your your face looks horrendously lopsided because we've been so accustomed to seeing our mirror image and not. And it's something different when you're live and reacting to it, other than rather than seeing yourself in a photograph. Well, when Stuart and I were when Dexter Sinister was participating in the Whitney Biennial in the spring of 2008, the one physical kind of uh, intrusion we made into the exhibition was to insert these mirrors um, into the restrooms uh, in the second floor of the Whitney um, building on in the exhibition and in the armory building, uh, ancillary building, where they were doing performance projects. Uh, we, it was important to us that, that we put these mirrors, here it is, installed in one of the Whitney bathrooms, in the men's bathroom. It's important to us that this was not kind of flagged out as an artist project of a crazy mirror in the bathroom, but it was actually just a mirror. It was an applied project, and it was, it, but it had some gestural quality to it, perhaps. Um, or perhaps not, but here's a photograph in the mirror, and here is, um, well, the mirror into another mirror. And it, has, it, it occupies a kind of gray zone that I know a lot of the work that I'm interested in straddles. And that is, you can't tell whether it's, for example, part of an art exhibition, whether it's a kind of support material, whether it's a catalog, whether it's a um, performance, a theater thing, a piece of software, whatever. It kind of straddles in between these areas. And those, those are very productive areas to jump in because people can't tell you it's not that or it's not this. They don't have models or names in which to class these things within. And it gives a pretty powerful, powerful, useful platform um, to exist. And not, not saying that in a cynical way. It's not about garnering power, but it is, it is about uh, kind of opening up some running room in between clearly defined uh, modes of practice and seems pretty productive to do. Okay, we're coming, this is the third signal of six. Uh, this is, this third signal is the Lisa Zhu figure. It uh, looks like a sideways uh, infinity sign, and it's, it's in fact, it's a, it's a form that's made when two sine waves, which are just general S waves, come into and out of phase. And when they come into perfect phase, the two sound waves, they make a shape like this, which looks like an infinity, or any one of a number of other Lisa Zhu figures. And this has been a kind of intriguing thing to think about and to use in a lot of different methods. I'm going to show you a video here, uh, borrowed from YouTube, of a Lisa Zhu figure um, running as we go. I'm just going to continue to talk over it um, just a bit. Actually, I'll let it play in a minute. But uh, The Lisa Zhu figure was named after Claude Antoine Lisa Zhu, a French mathematician in the 19th century, um, who, who was investigating issues of phasing, when kind of periodic cycles of time line up to each other and come into phase and inevitably fall out of phase once again. And this, this is what you, off, you often might find this shape on the front of an oscilloscope of a round screened um, electric test equipment, if you've maybe seen something like this. Uh, you can see it in a laser light show. I mean, it's the kind of thing um, you might have kind of, you might find any number of high school students very interested in. Um, I'm also quite interested in it. Um, what we're seeing here is the two sine waves coming into and then falling out of phase again when they start to rotate and cycle in what looks like three-dimensional space, they're falling out of phase once again. They're staying pretty good, and they're staying pretty much in there, but it's quite beautiful when it falls. When it hits that flipping motion is when it's fully in phase. So you'll notice by the sound as well. There we go. And there's something about that as a way to think about a kind of cyclic or cyclical intermittent time that resonates really strongly with me and has found its way into a number of projects. Okay. 
Um, not the least of which is this, okay? This is another, uh, this happens to precede the other, but we're not talking about chronological sequence. I will ignore that. Uh, this is another study of the Lisa Ju figure. This was made, this was a laser light show that I staged at my old studio at ORG in probably 2000, something like that. I'm not sure what year exactly. Uh, no, probably 2002, something like this. Anyway, it was a laser light show. Simple, simple trick that I kind of gleaned off the internet. Um, I'd seen somebody else do it before. It involves having a speaker and a mirror on the speaker and playing sounds through the mirrored speaker and pointing laser pointers at the, at the mirror, which is on the speaker, which vibrates and then makes shapes on the wall, um, which looks something like this. If you do it correctly, it starts to form a Lisa Jew. And I'm gonna jump through a little bit of this. Now this was in the con actually may I let it go. Um, this was in the context of a Christmas party. And this is a, a Christmas party and lasers at uh, ORG studio and kind of a ridiculous um, but useful thing to do. Are we gonna see some more? Okay, here's a later version of the same thing, which I made for an exhibition in Estonia, in Tallinn, Estonia, for when Dot 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 was doing an exhibition there. There were three, installed three lasers, three dots. Uh, by this point, I would kind of refined the technique slightly, and they start to form a little bit closer to Lisa's use, they're never really quite right. Uh, the lasers like some music better than others. The lasers quite like late 70s Bowie. You hear a lot of that. They like Pink Floyd too, early Pink Floyd. Go figure. Uh, this is the laser light show machine in a portable format. It's not like it's been transported that many times. But I, I like this picture because you see a couple other signals kind of coming in from the past. Um, transmitted onto the wall here, that, that blazon we saw at the beginning, and this is one you'll see later. I'm just warning you, and that's one you'll see. That's another one of this. Anyway, these things tend to kind of follow, f roll along in trajectories. I think this thing traveled one time, so here it is going to travel. Uh, as I mentioned, it was set up for a Christmas party. This is a photograph in the studio during the Christmas party. We had a fog, we bought a fog machine, got the fog machine working in a 400 square foot studio um, with Christmas lights. It was very festive, very nice. Uh, another place where this image appears is on the back page of a science fiction novel that I co-wrote with seven other people. Um, this novel was written as part of an art project which happened in Dublin, uh, Ireland at Project Art Center in um, 2006. Uh, it was a kind of remainder project from Manifesto, one of the artists involved in that kind of restaged the project in Ireland through a series of chain of coincidences. He organized eight people together in uh, in Dublin for a week to sit at a table who had some nominal interest in science fiction or some predilection to it, to sit at a table and write a book in eight days. I mean, kind of an absurd thing. They, they channeled the exhibition money in order to set up this production situation. And we weren't performing in the gallery. We were actually upstairs in the bar, like not publicly doing this. But it was a way to make a product with the kind of normal funding mechanism of an exhibition. That I thought was a particularly nice thing. It was done with one of the curators from Manifesto who we worked closely with. Of course, with any science fiction book, the thing you gotta do first is you gotta write, do the back cover, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing that kind of summarizes the, the text. And here, I'm not gonna read it, but here is the kind of plot summary. This book is available in the bookstore should you like to read a eight day science fiction novel, which actually turned out not so bad because there are better writers, uh, not myself, um, included in it. This is the back page from it. Uh, the entire plot line followed the shape of the Lisa Jew because I had introduced that as kind of a contribution while we were talking about this thing. And then therefore it appears again on the back of the book. Um, this is the front of the book, the front of Philip. Uh, again, the Lisa Jew figures here, though in a bit more abstract manner, but you might notice her hair um, takes a kind of Lisa Jew like format. Um, this was the front, yeah, this is the front of Philip. Uh, a uh, lady who should be Cassandra in the story who is turning her back on the audience. Now, now as it turns out, that was the person who was across the street who was serving us coffee every day, um, <coughs> who had fabulous hair, was also a hairdresser, and we kept on noticing her hair, and finally somebody asked her if she would maybe pose for the catalog, for the cover of the book, and she was really into it, and she happened to wear that fantastic uh, gray leopard skin coat 
brilliant. And then we had her against the concrete wall outside the bar uh, in Dublin. Kind of worked out quite nicely. But but I've grown to become more and more kind of reliant on these these certain coincidences or. Uh, you know, th things lining up, just not worrying about it too much and kind of uh, taking full advantage of anything that follows on one to the next. And this was, you know, this was not my idea to have her on the cover of somebody else's. It was Hemans who's sitting here photographing her. But the result was quite, I, I was really pleased with it. Um, I should mention that book was published um, uh, in a limited run of 100 first and then 200 and then 300 and then 200 again, anyway, in, in various numbers printed on demand with Lulu, um, which is a, a mode of printing and distribution and publishing that uh, Dexter Sinister has been looking at. I mean, lots of people have been looking at it. It's a widely available print on demand mode, but kind of trying to find books where it actually makes sense and isn't simply a degraded form of offset printing. And in that case, not many people wanted to read this, so it made quite a lot of sense to make it in a small run first and let it build an audience. Um, that being said, I think it's not such a bad science fiction story. Not a very high bar to aim at. Okay, uh, the Lisa Zhu finds its way into another project here. Uh, this is at the Swiss Institute in New York, uh, an art uh, venue in New York City on Broadway. Um, this was for a performance and exhibition that uh, I did together with Jörg Laney, who's a Swiss uh, programmer, designer, artist, not sure what he is. Uh, Jörg was in New York for six months and um, had, we had been invited to do this exhibition together at the Switz Institute. Um, now Jörg has designed and programmed a spray painting machine that runs from a computer. And he doesn't like it to be called such, but I would call it a spray painting robot. It's basically you feed it a file and it will print that file using spray paint big on a wall. Um, in trying to figure out what to do with Hector, uh, I immediately thought, well, it'd be nice Nice to use it in an applied manner again. I don't want to simply do an art project in Swiss Institute that kind of comes and disappears. That didn't seem quite so interesting. And I knew that they typically install a mural in their hallway. This is a project I knew from years and I had admired before because it's a, well, I guess because it's applied and it's part of the structure of the gallery and it's not clear whether it's exhibition or something else. So I proposed that we do a mural together with Hector. And what we ended up doing was, uh, was to do a test performance for the mural, which you see here completed on the main wall in the gallery on one evening. And then a second later on in the evening, we did four more of these Lisa Zhu, these are all Lisa Zhu figures. Uh, we did four more permanently in the hallway. Well, permanently, it's been there for two years now. It'll stay for a while, not forever, obviously. Um, now, the way we staged the event was as a performance. It happened one night, happened for four hours at Swiss Institute. It was like a hot uh, September day, September night. Um, and we gathered people together who watched Hector, the spray painting robot, um, paint these Lisa Zhu figures. Now, I was particularly interested in a Lisa Zhu figure for Hector to draw because this is something which requires that he, that he never lets up the can, the spray, the top of the spray can. He never has to stop spraying paint because a Lisa Zhu is only made out of sine waves and sine waves happen to be the same way that Hector moves from its two supported places. I, I won't go into that with detail because I might not describe it well enough. But. Suffice it to say that uh, people came, they drank beer while watching uh, Hector spray this set of uh, figures on the wall. Here's a completed one. I'm going to show you a short, I'm going to show you a video um, of one of the pieces being uh, sprayed. You'll see here. Um, people are milling about. Now we did one thing, you'll see that Hector is essentially this rope, this string here holding a spray can run by a laptop computer that's just running a PDF. Um, from Illustrator, an Illustrator file actually. Uh, and there are two servo controlled motors here, top, right, and left, which move the spray paint can around to basically rig up a giant uh, pen plotting printer, but with a spray paint can instead. And that's quite visceral, nice results on the wall. Now we did one thing, you'll hear the, the whine of those, eng of those motors. So we did one thing to make it a bit more of a performance, which was we microphoned, we amplified both of the motors and we channeled them through a left speaker and a right speaker in the performance so that you heard the kind of this deafening roar of the machine as it was going, which just seemed like a useful, um, uh, nice thing to do, which we decided on the day, you know, that afternoon about 4 p.m. Uh, and it was based on something Hect uh, Jörg had, here you see Jörg running the thing. It was based on something that Jörg had wanted to do for a number of years, so it's nice to do it. It's going to start really drawing in a moment. It's a little bit of a lengthy video. But... 
As it turns out, Lisa Zhu figures have many more forms than that first form of the signal that I showed you. It doesn't always look like a sideways figure eight. It simply has, a, depending on the relationship between the two sine waves, it can make any number of different shapes. These are a number of them that we painted on the wall here. Uh, we painted four, four in the gallery that evening and four later on that evening. So it was from six to 12. We painted four in three hours and four in another three hours. Um, by the time the hallway was being painted, the fumes were really intense. Everybody was a bit drunk, and it was a nice event, I think. Chaotic a little bit. People are at least uh, sniffing paint fumes. Uh, this box on the floor, oops, which I can't really point at, is Hector itself. Um, it's a kind of relay between the computer. It's a combination of software and hardware. It's, I had nothing to do with the, any of the software parts other than I, I, did draw, I did write the piece of software that, that determined the Lisa Zhu figure shapes other than that uh, as a test along the way. So anyway. Here it's speeding up. Time is uh, performing in a more circular manner. That's the end of that. Lisa Juve comes back one, one final time. In fact, it comes back in the context of first signal we saw, the coat of arms, the badge. Uh, it comes back on the cover of a small booklet that uh, Stuart and I did together for, uh, for a Belgian art journal called A Priori. And anyway, the premise of the, of the little booklet was propose a project for documenta, any documenta in the future. And it was called Documenta Infinity, the project was. Now, the cover we designed like this, um, as it was published by Dexter Sinister in our role, and it was pretty heavy. Um, we designed it like this because we had since adopted this badge, but it turns out one of the curators from Manifesta 6, where we had originally designed the badge, was on the board at A prior, and he wasn't happy with this. And we know him, and we were surprised he wasn't happy, but he was really not happy at all about it being on the cover of this other publication because it kind of tainted it with his failed project, and I guess I can understand why. I mean, it's no problem. Uh, so we had to do something to correct it after we'd printed uh, quite a lot of these. Their circulation's pretty high, and we printed a lot of them. We were like, oh, shit, we have to do something to correct this. And so we uh, had already planned to print this image, this circular image, which is from a magazine called Control, done by artist Stephen Willits, British artist in the early 1970s. We already print, planned to print this circle, which stands for a spot of form of future reading. It had quite a nice time shift in it. So we'd already planned to print that circle as a sticker for the next issue of dot, dot, dot. We simply printed extras and plopped it on top of the offending logo, and ending up in maybe a more successful cover, I think. Um, little badge popping out of the edge there, saying hello. Um, okay. uh, you just saw this. This is the fourth, uh, the fourth signal. You just saw this on the front of the previous thing. Uh, this, I guess, I'll call the screen. Um, it's this shape right here. Now, this was a shape that originally came out of a screensaver, um, which I'll show you in a minute, but since these things aren't in order, uh, it's a complex graphic form. It's obviously coming out straight from the center. And I've used it, it's been something that's kind of followed me around since originally making it uh, any number of years ago, and I've used it in a series of kind of test prints where I've used this image in order to kind of test the limits of various modes of printing. This first one was simply a laser print. Uh, this one was printed on a stencil printer in the... Um, uh, two colors on a stencil printing process, another printing process. This one was printed on a color, um, on a fiery color printer. I've printed in the New York Times for an illustration uh, offset, I mean, a uh, web offset in the newspaper. Um, I've printed it, used it as an overhead projector image here. You see my giant hands. This is in the context of a lecture. Um, this was in London. It was just simply running as a screensaver, but it overlapped the, the uh, overhead projector, which I thought was actually quite a nice quite nice resulting image. Now this, this, uh, this screen, this, uh, this particular signal, uh, originated as a screensaver image. And it was for a screensaver that I made in the context of an applied project um, a number of years ago, and which I've since kind of followed and uh, taken a bit farther. Um, this screensaver shows you this image, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate what the screensaver looks like now. I have to do one thing in order to do that, to set the time to eight o'clock in the morning, because this screensaver shows you two different images. Um, here is what it looks like at eight o'clock in the morning. We'll let it go for a minute. It has kind of a hypnotic effect, if you're susceptible to that. 
um, I found it quite a nice, the, the constantly evolving form also is a way, a kind of, you know, meditative, uh, um, ridiculous form to kind of think about uh, alternative um, arrangements of time and these kinds of things. Well, this, this particular screensaver, uh, I spent about three years programming it. But first of all, because I didn't know what I was doing at the beginning. I was writing in an Objective-C, a kind of uh, difficult language to get my head around. And, uh, and I simply just didn't know what I was doing. And it seemed kind of worthwhile that it took that long to make it. But one, what, what this screensaver does is I figured it was nice. This screensaver switches between this sun image, or this screen, and it switches from this to a moon image. And it switches depending on when the sun sets. So your computer knows where you are in the world. You set its location. It knows what time it is. So then the sun sets and rises at different times of the day, depending on where you are and what time it is. Uh, in New York City, the sun might, might rise at 6.38 on March the 12th, you know, 2009, and at a slightly different time the next day. And, th and those are all calculable through a kind of great name, great name for an equation, the equation of time. Uh, which tells you when this, where the sun sets in different places. So it looks like this when the sun is rising. And now I'll go uh, just off to my, change the time on my computer manually. It is now eight, um, let's just make, it's definitely the sun is set, right? Yeah. It's now eight o'clock at night. And we can go back to the other. And now this is what it looks like at eight o'clock at night is the moon. But it was, it was a uh, kind of, and I've lived with this on my computer and shared it with other people and other people have downloaded it from the website and such things. But it had the, it kind of um, represents an approach to software and to these kind of like uh, modes which explicitly do change or which give ways to model time over time. Now, as it turns out, the sun follows, the, follows a certain place in the sky over the course of the years. I was saying it sets and rises at different times, different places. As it turns out, if you make a time exposure photograph of the sun in the sky from one place every day, same time, it traces out a path. This is all the sun. This is a one-year-long time exposure. It traces out a path which looks a bit like a Lisa Zhu figure, um, which I found entertaining, um, if a bit absurd. Okay. Uh, most recently, I've used this same image as the basis of a website that I'm currently doing right now, which is reforming my ORG practice as a, as a software company to sell small softwares like this, um, like this screensaver. And that's something in the same way that I kind of ventured into selling books. I'm seeing what it's like selling software. Who knows what it's like? But I don't think they'll sell for very much. We'll see. But this is in development right now. Okay. Which leads me to the fifth signal. See, they're picking up pace. The ast this asterisk, a particular asterisk. This asterisk is uh, originally appeared on a poster, and this is a poster printed at the Visible Language Workshop in uh, late 1970s, well, 1974, sorry, uh, by Muriel Cooper, who Andrew mentioned in the introduction, who ran the Visible Language Workshop at MIT, which is a printing and teaching and uh, designing workshop at MIT. Uh, this particular poster was something I found while, while a fellow at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And I pulled it out. I was immediately drawn to it. I think I thought it was amazing in the way it laid bare its kind of mode of production. And I just liked the way it looked. I liked the fact that it said it was, that it used an asterisk to refer back to the title, which has an asterisk in front of it and says asterisk. It uses three asterisks to refer back to here, video version. The, the kind of layering of that delay that's, that's uh, explicit in an asterisk seemed very nice to me. Now, in doing the research project on Muriel Cooper, I found this poster first. I just found this in an in a archive, and I put it up on the wall, took a picture of it. Later on, in about a year later, uh, working on the project, I found this image. And this was an image of students at the Visible Language Workshop at MIT, run by Muriel. Muriel's probably taking the picture, I imagine. Um, and I saw on the wall, amazingly, behind the students in their press in this workshop, I saw the asterisk again. And it kind of seemed quite nice to see this image of the thing in its context originally and to find it in the same circuitous roots. And it made a plausible uh, description of a kind of circular, circuitous uh, path through time that this shape is taking. Now, I've recently, uh, this, this image has been on my mind a lot recently, and it's, it's found its way into a project that Stuart and I, Dexter Sinister, has been doing together with the artist Shannon Ebner, who's a Los Angeles-based um, artist who makes photographs and other kinds of works. Um, Shannon, uh, we were commissioned by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art to make a book together with Shannon over the course of two years. And we spent a long time kind of hashing out the ideas and getting to, getting to a form, which was recently published and printed, uh, arrived in New York uh, a couple weeks ago. During that process, Shannon had read my article on Muriel Cooper and got also quite interested in this asterisk and became the kind of uh, puppy, the, the, the icon for this project throughout. Um, this 
this is a piece of work that Shannon made as a set of her strike letters, which were um, letters made on this grid. This is an asterisk. Um, you see, again, this was a poster that Dexter Sinister designed with Shannon for uh, the launch of the book, which happened two weeks ago in New York City. Um, the title of the book became The Sun as Error, um, and it's written a number of different ways. Here it's kind of written in a series of glyphs, the sun, that stands for sun, as error, if you believe that. Now Shannon also made, also used this poster, and we worked together with her to make a exhibition, to make an installation at the Armory Art Fair, which is two weeks ago in New York City, where she covered all the walls with this poster, and as well designed this concrete block, physical asterisk in the center of the space, which and we staged a night of we staged three consecutive evenings of launches for her book. This was the first one at the Armory, and each one was noted by an asterisk that continues you on to the next uh, venue. In the, on the booth, she as well added a few silk-screened asterisks over the top of, of the poster installation, which then found itself as the cover of the, the large format uh, publication that we just finished with Shannon, which I'm showing you a picture of here. This is The Sun is Error um, with Shannon Ebner, 2009, from Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, uh, the second event of the launch was a evening, well, an all-day-long uh, event of silk screening, where we uh, produced the asterisk on the covers of the unprinted books um, in advance of their launch that evening. Shannon Stewart and I spent the day at White Columns, a nonprofit space in New York City, uh, producing a series of books, which you see some of here on the floor. But it's really like the a bit like the Hector. Uh, Swiss Institute project. This was just an attempt to perform uh, a test run because we were just testing what kind of yellow, what yellow is going to be the final yellow. And once we arrived at one, we sent that book to the printer in Belgium to match that yellow and do all the rest to match perfectly. But it seemed like a kind of useful uh, experience to try and silk screen and see what the results were. Um, now that, that screen, that actual screen itself, then migrated a third time on the consecutive day to the Dexter Sinister basement, where we silk screened it directly onto the wall here, and had an all day long uh, book launch for Shannon's book, where we, brought, where we arranged to borrow the original poster back from MIT, and we hung it in our space. Um, here's Stuart holding up a mirror reflecting the badge on the other side, just seemed like a nice photo. Um, so it appears here on the wall, and it actually is directly across from that badge on the other, other wall, hence the mirror works. And finally, we use this, this same mark on, uh, at the center of a new website we just made, which is, uh, is shop.dextersinister.org, which, in which we sell online the same books that we sell in the bookstore. And this, this mark, this kind of cascading asterisk, stands for the kind of shop aspect of this. I'm not quite sure why, but it uh, just migrates in that way. Okay, this is the last signal. This is a post. This is a post horn. Uh, maybe people recognize it. Perhaps it's a muted post horn. Um, it's a symbol that Stuart and I, that Dexter Sinister has used kind of since our inception, which I would say was 2006, since we opened the space on Ludlow Street. Anyway, so three years. Uh, it's something we've used a lot since then. Uh, we love the idea that it's a herald, that it is actually a herald. It's a something to announce. It's a horn. It announces something, but it's a muted horn. It announces it and cancels it itself out at the same time. It's quite an appealing idea for a number of reasons. It also has a compelling graphic form. Uh, now you see this symbol so, uh, graffiti, stencil printed up on the wall, up around New York City. I mean, I didn't really realize it until I started to get interested in it, but you do see it uh, up and around on the walls of New York City. And when we opened Extra Sinister, we, we decided to also add it to the exterior of our space. So we silt screened it here on the post. And it announces the kind of opening. Here you see the entrance to Dexter Sinister, which is down a set of stairs on the uh, ground level in a kind of somewhat, um, well, on a street in Chinatown uh, where, the, yeah, where the entrance is underneath one of these grates. So it marks the shop when the shop is closed and you can't see the sign. Now, we use that, this uh, heraldic post horn in a number of things. We use it when we announce the opening of Dexter Sinister of the workshop. We use it on an announcement card here. Um, but the original kind of primary source of it is from The Crying of Lot 49, a, a novel by Thomas Pynchon. Um, here it is in the context of the original publication. And, and that happened to be something that I was, uh, well, Stuart and I had both read not very long before uh, opening up the shop, just happened to be 
we were reading it. And in the book, it stands, this post horn marks an alternative distribution network, it, a parallel post office, a way to send things around that doesn't rely on the federal government, U.S. Postal Service. And it's called the WASTE, the W period, A period, S period, T period, E period, WASTE network. And it's a way to, it marks wherever you can kind of enter a, a thing into this alternative distribution network. So immediately, given that meaning and its form, seemed like a great thing to kind of cannibalize or to use exactly as it is, precisely as it is and meaning what it is. Um, you'll see it here, you'll see that signal here. On, this is a microfiche. This is a very small a microfiche, this big. Uh, this is a microfiche that we made at the end of our project for the Whitney Biennial, um, which was a way to archive all of the press releases. I haven't described that in any detail, and I'm not particularly going to. Um, but this, this, uh, this microfiche was a way to document all of the pieces of paper and releases and videos that we made during three weeks of residency in that exhibition. Uh, and the arc, the we imagined immediately that this microfiche was a kind of form that was just falling out of favor. I mean, you don't really archive things on microfiche anymore. But also it kind of cut, at a, it fell on an interesting crease between digital archiving and uh, physical archiving because um, there there, there's a murky territory in between these things. Uh, we imagine this not simply as an archive, though, although we uh, provided it for the Whitney as they wanted to include it back into their collection. Um, but we imagine it instead as a score. And it was a score for something we had in mind during the three weeks of doing the Whitney Biennial Project, and that, that was to make a performative lecture um, after the fact, and this would be the score for it. So we did a performance at the kitchen, a performance venue in New York City, November of this year, November last year, uh, based upon that tiny little uh, Microfiche projected quite large on a screen, in this case mechanically, by an overhead projector, because we thought that was quite important. And we involved about uh, 15, 20 other artists, writers, designers, different people, to come perform the text, snippets of the text, in different ways. Like, for example, this is Michael Portnoy, uh, performance artist in New York, who's wearing mirrored sunglasses and reciting parts of a po part of a poem that was part of this project. As the entire event was unfolding, Stuart and I, here's Stuart, we're running around and kind of guiding the audio, visual, soundboard, lighting, et cetera, while the thing was unfolding as a way to kind of model a feedback process as it turns out, so that we were kind of adjusting the performance and we in fact changed the end of it differently than what we were intending. And it got a bit complicated. We had a set of, there was um, a music performance during part of it. There were overlapping faxes coming in, somebody drawing on an overhead projector, a PowerPoint presentation all running simultaneously, um, a bit like that two-channeled introduction I played for you, but a bit more frenetic, but also more carefully staged, maybe. Um, here they are speaking from two lecterns, which are mirrors of those uh, two produced in London. Um, this kind of performative project falls, it may seem like a stretch from some of the other work I've shown you, but it, but it, seems, but it is a form that seems to come quite naturally um, from some of the other projects, which have temporal dimensions to them, they just aren't so explicitly that way in form. Now, if, now, m even most recently, this is currently up in uh, Eindhoven in the Netherlands in art exhibition. Um, we were asked to submit some, to participate in that exhibition. We decided what we do was take the original film for that microfiche. It's all made. It's a big loop of big roll of 16 mil millimeter film, and to make a film loop of that and just let that play, and we recorded a soundtrack for, from it. I'm going to play you an excerpt of that, and if you watch carefully, you'll see the post horn among many other things. But the where and the when questions are also profoundly important. It looks like what it does. A certain period of time in a particular geographic location. The branches indeed. So that post horn is kind of, it seems to me, uh, the most kind of present example of this idea of a signal, of a kind of form that cast back from time, which arrives in the present moment, uh, kind of affected by various kinds of interference and noise and this kind of thing. Now we use that as a symbol during the our project for the 2008 Whitney Biennial called True Mirror. Uh, we, for one thing, we made it as a small button, which you see here, close detail of. 
which released the door. We were, we were occupying going to work every day for three weeks in a secret room uh, in the exhibition. Here, occupied be kind of kind of Scooby Doo secret door. Press on the button, the wall opens up like such. And we are in this room called the commander's room doing a series of basically working, making a series of press releases. We were calling them working together with people, basically designing a series of press releases which went out during the course of the show. Um, okay. Uh, one of the, those press releases took many forms. Uh, one of those forms was as a video press release released on YouTube. And I'd like to end this talk now by playing this video. Uh, which was one of the press releases. This is, uh, and I'll just kind of seed the lecture over to Steve Russian, who's the writer and artist who's uh, making this particular video. This video is about seven minutes long. Um, it is uh, Steve attempting to describe to the camera um, what feedback is and the way in which signals travel over time and hit noise and kind of distort themselves and rearrange themselves and these kind of things. I think Steve says it a bit better than, than I have here, perhaps. And he cuts together his own attempt to explain it at the camera uh, with a film by Charles and Ray Eames called A Communications Primer, which is about similar subject matter, uh, which explicates the whole issue even more clearly. Steve is sitting in the commander's room. He's wearing a uniform that we'd made during the project. You'll see the symbol on his chest, and you'll see him cutting in and in between. And I'm going to play this and sit down, and that will be, or play this and stand away from it, and then uh, that's it. Okay. In the broadest aspects of communication, much work has recently been done to clarify theories and make them workable. The era we are entering might well be characterized as an era of communication. This film will touch in the most elementary way some aspects of the subject that are of daily concern to all of us. The notion of feedback is all pervasive in contemporary culture, a technical and behavioral mechanism which today works on all levels of the media, from reality TV shows to the construction and broadcast of a news event to everyday email exchanges and social networking activity. It is black or white. Okay, today I'd like to talk a little bit about feedback. And I'd like to oppose it to the notion of a, a sort of top-down media. That's a media where we sit as passive objects consuming. So feedback is basically a notion that was invented, uh, it's a neologism, and it was invented in the, 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 the late 40s uh, as a term by a man called Norbert Wiener. What Wiener did was uh, he, he periodized our, uh, he retrospectively sort of went back and said, well, really, the cybernetics is based on something called the, the Kybernetes. He's, he's, he's a Greek uh, sailor and he's in a boat and he's, 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 he, he's got knowledge of the tides. He's got, you know, he knows about the wind, he knows how the vessel operates, so he can guide the, the ship into port. Mm -hmm. So it was the idea that, that, the, that cybernetics was something to do with guiding. You know, a, a guidance system, and of course, what what the Kybernetes is doing on the on the prow of this ship is he's uh, he's anticipating what 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 would happen, and and changing his behaviour in accordance in, in accordance to, to to say maybe a change of wind or whatever. So that's essentially the notion of feedback. Here is Claude Shannon's diagram by which almost any communication process can be schematically represented. The information source selects the desired message out of a set of possible messages. The transmitter changes the message into the signal, which is sent over the communications channel to the receiver, where it is decoded back into the message and delivered to the destination. Every such system contains noise. Noise is a term used in the communications field to designate any outside force which acts on the transmitted signal to vary it from the original. Now what Wiener did was he managed to create a whole uh, a whole sort of pa paradigm uh, in, in, in his book Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and Machine from 1948. And the, the, what the paradigm did is it started in that, so indeed with this, this mythical character 
in the Greek times, and it went right through to the modern day, uh, positing lots of different types of feedback mechanism. So one of them, which is a mythical one, of course, which is also very poetic and very beautiful, is the idea of the uh, Golem of Prague, who was a sort of a, uh, a man who was magically animated, a robot before the, the realization of techno technological possibility of robots. So he charts periods in history, in, in the technological development of people, which, uh, which use different sorts of, of uh, feedback mechanisms. And I'll mention two. And the first is the idea of the governor, which comes from the 19th century, and this is, the, 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 this is something which allows uh, a steam engine, for instance, to, to, to let off steam so that it doesn't blow up. So it regulates the, the, the pressure uh, of, a, of, a, of the engine and, and you may see if you ever go to transport museums that there's a sort of a steam engine with these two balls that, that, that rotate quite dramatically and that's actually what the governor is. And the second important one would be the idea of a server mechanism. Now a good example of a server mechanism would be um, the, uh, a thermostat. Uh, that you have in your, your central heating system. So what that does, uh, and it's, a, it's a kind of a, a technological innovation, is that it regulates the whole environment. So that's the, the, uh, the you know, it, 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 it understands <laughs> what, what temperature a human being is most comfortable at and regulates accordingly. A choice of two gives one bit of information. This is the amount of information that one on-off circuit can handle at one time. It can be on or off. Two bits of information is the amount two circuits can handle. There is a choice of four possible conditions. On-off, off-on, on-on, or off-off. Three circuits can handle three bits, or a choice of eight possibilities. Four circuits, four bits, or 16 possibilities. Five bits, 32 possibilities. Six bits, 64. Amount of information increases as the logarithm of the number of choices. But one thing that's also important is this idea of that information becomes divorced from its carrier. Now a good example of this would be actually Morse code, which is one of the first uh, binary systems that, 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 that used, and this is how Morse code worked, of course, is it was a disembodied message. Samuel Morse had, had great difficulty getting people to fund Morse code because it seemed so spectral, it seemed so disembodied, it seemed so peculiar. The system calls for the key to be either up or down. The code calls for a dot or a dash. The current flows, it ceases to flow, it flows. It is black or white. It is stop or go. We have an understanding of everything being encoded, of everything, you know, of, of, of reality actually at a very fundamental level it has something to do with a, a code. On or off, one or none, go or no go, or black or white. So, on, on, again, on a biological level, there is a code to DNA. The, 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 you know, we are encoded, our very bodies are encoded. It is black or white. So all of these things come together uh, in this idea of what Catherine, Catherine N. Hales calls the ontology of the code. That, that it's actually an ontolo ontological claim uh, that the, the generation of, uh, that, of uh, Wiener Etc. have been making, and this is that, that we are fundamental, that the reality itself is, is something to do with code. In any communication system, the receiver must be able to decode something of what the transmitter coded, or no information gets to the destination at all. If you speak Chinese to me, I must know Chinese to understand your words. But even without knowing the Chinese language, I can understand much of your feelings through other codes we have in common. We no longer believe that, that, that we live in a very complex world which we, you know, are given to understand, that, you know, that we can kind of understand with enough studying, but rather that, that, that complex things run from very simple systems, like a simple binary system, to complexity. And so there's a really a different way of looking at reality once we start to understand 
the the world as 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 as, you know, as, as encoded. But there are also many examples of times when the message has been conceived and the signal sent long in advance of understanding or acceptance of the code employed. In the case of Galileo or Socrates, it did not in time matter that the receivers of their time were not tuned to receive their signal. The ultimate transmission of such a message represents communication of a very complex order. Other high-level communication occurs in very different areas. A wave breaking on a beach brings a world of information about events far out at sea. It can tell of winds and storms, the distance and the intensity. It can locate reefs and islands and many things, if you know the code. That's it. We have uh, we have uh, some time to take some questions. There's uh, because we're broadcasting and webcasting it. There are two ushers with microphones in each of the aisles. So if you uh, would like to ask a question, you could raise your hand. We can pass in the mic. We just want to make sure you get the question. What was the what was the name of the Ray and Charles Ames film? A Communications Primer. Thank you. Yeah, it's not on the DVDs, but it is on the internet. It's on the Internet Archive. If you like to track it down, it's it's fantastic. Yeah. How dogmatic any of the philosophies that are espoused are in the formation of the Yeah, yeah. Uh, should, should, I, should I restate it? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Andrew was asking, he was, uh, if you happen to be tuning into one of the channels or the other during that double introduction, you heard me kind of recounting a story of being at an art school. <laughs> And being asked a question, which actually I've heard a bunch of times, which is, uh, does I mean, it was specifically to do with Dexter Sinister, but anyway, it's all the same approximately, which is, which is just, uh, does Dexter Sinister have a, some, uh, you know, how does Dexter Sinister align itself to the kind of modernist, maxim, modernist tradition of absolute transparency and truth in materials, right? Which is kind of high modernism, first wave modernism in its... Uh, full, clear state. And you can see a lot of the projects are certainly investigating or uh, foregrounding their modes of production, like how the thing was made is a big part and certainly a big interest. But there's a funny way that we've answered that, and it's completely truthful, is not to kind of get out of that question. I think it's a problematic question, like why, why would that be relevant now, 50 years after when it was first kind of relevant, but I think I would immediately just say that some of those problems aren't closed and they have a kind of uh, not a sequential relationship but a more circuitous, circular relationship. But the, the answer that, we, that we've given, or at least I was recounting there, was, was that, yeah, certainly, yeah, we believe in, uh, in transparency of materials or using materials in a way that they want to be used in certain uh, projects or to kind of reveal the mechanisms of how something was made seems like a kind of ethically useful thing to do. Um, but at the same time, as much as we believe in that, we equally believe in not being dogmatic um, or not, cl not clinging to any sort of dogma or first principles, but simply to take the situation, whatever situation it is, and take the concrete facts available right then and kind of readjust whatever you think in accordance with that. And I think that it's a kind of non-answer, you know, because it's kind of saying, yeah, we believe this, but no, we don't really believe that. But it's it feels that kind of circular logic feels, it's a, it's a question we get asked a lot, and that actually feels like a pretty useful response, at least for us. I hope it's, uh, I hope some of that retelling is clear enough. <laughs> circular. We give it, we get, I guess in the talk I, I described, a, it has the same logic as the following two sentences, um, which is the, uh, 
which is, um, and now let me remember how the sentences go. The following statement is false. The preceding statement is true. I guess I would, yeah. Anyway, sorry, it kind of collapses a brain at one moment. Uh, the work that you presented here is centered around signals. Um, what is it that got you first interested in signals? Hmm. Yeah, great. Um, well, I mean, I think that's a fairly recent kind of rubric for me anyway to file it under. But uh, uh, I mean, it certainly came from a reading of uh, of the cyber discourse of cybernetics in the middle of the um, 20th century, of which that film, A Communications Primer, kind of lays out in its most bare, clear, direct didactic form. But it's, uh, uh, I suppose, signals are appealing because in thinking about what a designer does, what a graphic designer does in particular, you're letting loose these things in the world and you're letting loose, they appear in multiples and they're even more uh, powerful when they're not embodied in a form. So that's why, you know, logos and branding are so pervasive. That's one reason why they're so pervasive is they travel through all sorts of media. They lodge in our brains in different ways. They get communicated in different ways and they, they circulate and become part of our daily existence in a pretty powerful way. And that to me sounded more like a signal than it did like an object that kind of transfers around. And uh, I guess just, uh, why to frame this talk in particular like this was just through the reading of this book, which I was just recently doing, The Shape of Time, where, where that's taken from wholesale directly, like with no alteration really. But, but signals seemed like a good way to think about it that's separate from book or poster or website or whatever. Um, and most, but most, I guess most critically is just the fact that those things distort. Those things are never right here, those signals. They've been made at some other time. They come to you. They travel some distance in time and space, whatever. And when you receive them, they're not quite what was meant to be sent. And that's very interesting to me. That's kind of the most interesting part, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, nothing else? Okay. Thank you.